Good afternoon, Club 17. I'm filling in for President Dave today, who's on vacation at the beach. And for anybody who saw the presentation and speaker last week, you know that Dave was really inspired by it and said that he planned to climb the biggest rock he could find at the beach. <laughs> and I think, I think we actually have a close-up, too, if I remember right, that he sent. Uh, let's see. Oh, there he is. Okay. <laughs> so it's not the kind of beach trip I've had, but I think he's having a great time. Uh, we have a great program today, really looking forward to it. And we're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance led by Dan Shea. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And we'll stay, remain standing for the invocation and four-way test that Molly Rydell is going to lead us in. Thank you, Almost President Brett. Good afternoon, everyone. We have a small but quality crowd I see today. Let us, let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, accept our thanks for this day that you have given us, for its blessings, its opportunities, and its challenges. We ask that you guide and direct our club, its leaders, and our actions. Grant that each of us feels our responsibility to Rotary, to our community, to our country, and indeed to all countries and peoples. We pray for strength and guidance. May we be challenged to always give our best, and may we be assured of your presence with us every step of the way. Thank you for this opportunity today to learn from our speaker, Ms. Laura Mitchell, Superintendent of Cincinnati Public Schools, and may Ms. Mitchell continue her outstanding achievements in educating our community's children. We ask these things in your name, Almighty Father, amen. Now let us recite the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. We have some announcements today. First thing though, let's start with birthdays. Uh, tomorrow uh, is the birthday of Susan Snodgrass and Jim Brooks. And June 29th is the birthday of Barbara Dickerson. So happy birthday to all. And some club business. Uh, you should have gotten your invoice recently uh, in terms of dues and if you pay prepaid lunches, that would have been included. Just a, a quick comment. Make sure to lead, read the cover note and the invoice carefully because we re, we've opened up a lot of flexibility of payment options. So take a look at it. If you have any questions, call the office. Uh, make sure to um, pay by July 15th, or if you have any issue paying by July 15th, please call the office in advance and let them know. And if you're a young professional member, an active member, and you'd like to pay a full 12 months of dues and lunches in advance, uh, pay those by check, and then you will get a discount for paying by check for the full year. Uh, it, it's exciting. President Dave mentioned this last week, but we're now at a point, and we're all adjusting through where, where, what we are going through as a country, but we're at a point that we can do a hands-on service project, and we're excited about it. Uh, there'll be our first hands-on service project of the new Rotary year, Saturday morning, July 18th, at Norwood Schools. It'll be an outdoor cleanup effort. Uh, we'll be doing some raking and pruning and just general cleanup. We'll need to bring our own implements to do that with, edgers and trimmers and uh, rakes and you, you name it. Uh, Bill Stilley is in charge of hands-on service projects for next year. And if you'd like to be part of that, please call Bill. We're looking for 30 volunteers. We'll have uh, three teams of 10 people working on that. Should be a great project trying to get Norwood schools ready for the new school year and to welcome students back. Uh, some dates to, to keep in mind. Um, some of you, some of us, may have already been participating in the virtual meetings that Rotary International has done in lieu of having the big convention. There have been some great 
online meetings. Uh, those will wrap up tomorrow after a full week. Uh, some great learnings from one club to another around the world. Uh, just a reminder, no meeting next week. No meeting July 2nd. We, we're taking that off as the Thursday before the Independence Day holiday. So we'll meet again in two weeks here for changing of the guard. And uh, the next week after that, July 16th, will be Wally Emerling Day. And uh, just some big things coming up. So we're, we're moving again, guys. I think it's a great thing. So some member news. Many thanks to Carl Kappas and Jerry and Nancy Reese, Bob and Mary Brandstetter, Linda Muth and her husband Tom and daughter Caroline for volunteering at the FC Cincinnati Learning is Cool celebration uh, this past Tuesday night. Our foundation donated $14,000 to that effort to recognize students of anybody who had gotten an A honor roll twice in the past year. So it was a great recognition for the students and a great time in terms of honoring them and really promoting what education is about. So um, proud of the club, proud of the foundation for that, a great effort. And, and on a, a sad note, longtime Rotarian and past president Cromer Mashburn is under hospice care. And his wife, Bonnie, has said that the nurses are keeping him comfortable, but do not anticipate he will be with us much longer. So please keep Cromer and Bonnie and the whole Mashburn family in your thoughts and prayers. And our condolences, too, to fellow Rotarian Mary Metz Dicker. Keep her in your thoughts and prayers uh, and her family as well as they mourn the loss of her father, Larry Metz, last Tuesday. And, and on a, a bit happier note, um, we had a, a good article written about one of our new members, Kevin Potts, and his daughter, Jillian. It was in the Monday morning edition of the Enquirer. And Kevin is involved with the uh, Ken Anderson Alliance, heading that up. And how many of you saw your July Rotarian magazine this past week? Okay, T take a look for that because in, in there you'll see a wonderful article that mentions our club. It mentions Deborah Schultz and the World Affairs Committee for the work that we did, and they really did, to launch an effort on Solarize Uganda Now, or S-U-N, Sun. That's been a fantastic project working in schools and health centers in Uganda. That project is about two-thirds of the way done after several years, and there's more work being done. Nathan Thomas, I think a lot of us got to meet Nathan or hear him talk. Nathan Thomas was a UC engineering student, and while he was a student at UC, he really became affiliated with our club, and we su supported, and Deborah Schultz mentored him, and he has gone on to lead that project. He's now in Raleigh, North Carolina, in Rotary there, very active as a leader, and I think he's in line to be district governor, still in his 20s. Uh, a, a really impressive young man. I'm really proud of our club for helping to mentor him and sponsor him and, and help launch that program, Solarize Uganda Now. So um, many thanks, and I will say that if you're not going to keep your Rotarian magazine when you're done reading it, uh, hold the copy. Deborah Schultz is going to send some extra copies of it to Nathan Thomas so he can share them with family and friends. And then a quick shout out to two Rotarians, Tony and before Achari, who donated a thousand face masks to people in Ghana to help the community battle the COVID-19 virus. Well done, Tony and before. <laughs> and now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Laura Mitchell. Laura has been to our club before. We have a very good collaboration between Rotary and Cincinnati Public Schools. As you know, Laura is the superintendent of Cincinnati Public Schools. She was the only internal uh, candidate considered for that role in a nationwide search that started December 2016. Before she was appointed as superintendent, she was a deputy superintendent and chief academic officer. She led the implementation implementation of major academic improvement strategies such as the elementary initiative. 
which raised achievement in the district's 16 lowest performing elementary schools. Her leadership and collaboration with a team of principals, teachers, instructional coaches elevated the district to a rating of effective, making CPS the first and only urban school district in Ohio to earn this distinction. She also launched My Tomorrow, a comprehensive college and career readiness initiative. And Laura is a lifelong Cincinnatian, a proud graduate of the School for Creative and Performing Arts, a graduate of Bennett College in North Carolina, and received a master's degree at UC, and has really made her career in education, almost all of it in Cincinnati Public Schools. Uh, she's had a number of roles, including being a teacher, assistant principal, principal, teaching coach, uh, contributing across the whole district even before she became superintendent. And as the Cincinnati Enquirer once put it, Laura doesn't have one motivator, she has 35,000, the students. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Laura Mitchell to Rotary. Good afternoon. I'm uh, happy and excited to be with you um, today, so thank you for having me. Thank you for the invitation. So I will say that maybe the women in the room will appreciate this. I think lipstick sales are going way down because <laughs> our mouths are covered and eyeshadow and eye makeup is going way up. Um, so it's, it's been uh, quite a bit of a challenge to work through a mask all the time, but um, appreciate being live and in person with you today, so thank you. So I first, before I want to start to talk about what's happening in CPS in terms of the future, I want to give you just a little bit of a backdrop into the work that started at the beginning of this last school year, we're at the end of the school year, um, which entailed us launching a new strategic plan. And our plan launched in August of 2019, and it involved increasing our enrollment, academic achievement, health and wellness, community engagement. And um, this past school year, we opened two brand new schools. Four years ago, we opened three schools, and next school year, we will open two more new schools. So we are the fastest growing urban district in the state where other districts are losing um, enrollment, we're actually gaining in enrollment. So we were doing well on track with the implementation of our strategic plan, monitoring with the board with a scorecard that we present on a quarterly basis, and then our world turned upside down. So in February, um, we received, started to get notices about the pandemic and um, started to prepare a pandemic plan. So many years ago, we had a pandemic plan when there was the big scare regarding um, the bird flu. Do you all remember that? And we thought we would never ever have to use those plans and we had to dig those plans out and dust them off and add a lot more to the work in terms of thinking about what will be our approach to moving forward to ensure, first of all, the safety of our kids as well as the academic achievement and progress of our young people. And so you know that in March, the governor decided to close schools, and he announced it, I believe it was on a Thursday, and he announced that, that following Monday would be the last day. So we figured we have a chance, we have two days to make sure we have everything together, get our packets of work all ready to go. And over the weekend, I received phone call after phone call after phone call where people knew of someone or had been in the presence of someone who had COVID. So we start off with one school. And then someone would call and say, well, my child spent the night at the student's house at this other school. And it just kept going and going, and going until finally over the weekend I said, well, to 20 schools and we're done and we'll just close the district. And so we closed it. Um, Friday was the last day when we ended Monday being our last day. Um, but very quickly, we had to pivot and think about our kids in terms of what are some of the core services that they depended upon us for that we won't be able to um, provide immediately? And how can we adjust? So um, about 76% of our kids are on free and reduced lunch, and so they heavily depend on lunch and breakfast. And so school was closed on Friday. By Tuesday, 
We had meal hubs, 24 of them open at schools across our district for a two-hour window where any child ages 1 through 18 could go and get free meals. And it didn't matter which school district you were a part of, so we didn't ask any questions about are you sensei public, charter, Catholic, private, any child could come up and get meals. So we opened our hubs Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and each time you come you would get four meals, two breakfasts and two lunches, which would carry you to the next day. Um, and then um, Friday we gave two meals. And we started those hubs immediately. And then our partners started bombarding us, and in a good way. And GE Aviation came to us and said, you know, Laura, there are a lot of things that we could do to help you, but we want to help you on the academic front. And so we had prepared academic packets for our kids, every grade level, K through, actually pre-K through 12th grade. And they said, we will pay Federal Express to copy all of those for you and help get those out to your young people. And then Staples came through and they said, you know, we heard about what GE is doing for you and we want to help you too. So if you send us the electronic file, a parent can come into any one of our staple locations within the city of Cincinnati, tell us the grade level, and we'll copy the materials and get them to you. So, I mean, so many people came forward to help us. It's just been really an incredible movement. So for the first, I would say, three weeks, we were in crisis mode. And then we very quickly decided to make an adjustment and to start to think about the future of CPS. And we knew that if we stayed in crisis mode too long, then we wouldn't be moving forward. And so we put two teams in place, a team that really focused on the crisis that was at hand and a team that focused on the future of CPS. And as we think about what happened in terms of our education system being turned upside down, we realize this is an opportune time for us to fundamentally change some things we've always wanted to change, but couldn't because the system wouldn't allow for it to happen. So in many ways, it was a blessing in disguise in terms of disrupting the current system to enforce change, which has been really exciting for us. So now I'll talk to you about the work moving forward and how we have thought about what the future of CPS will look like. And we know that remote learning has to be a part of our plan. We have to ensure that our kids have access to technology and Wi-Fi to be able to access digital curriculum. It is the way that the world is operating and moving. Before I came here today, I think I did five video conference calls sometimes spending up to eight hours a day. And so this is how we operate now. And our kids will have to be able to operate in a very similar way. So if there's nothing else that you walk away with when you leave here, there are three key messages that I really want to make sure that you walk away with. And that is safety and health is fundamentally the most important thing above teaching and learning. Our parents have to feel that their kids are safe when they're in our care, and the adults who work with our kids have to make sure we're putting measures in place to ensure their safety. Next is to accelerate academic achievement. So our kids lost 10 weeks of being face-to-face -face with our teachers, and so it's not about remediation intervention. It's about how can we push them forward faster to make up time that was lost. And then the last is about equity. And so when, when we talk about equity, we know through surveys that we have close to 37,000 kids. Of those kids, 11,000 households don't have access to Wi-Fi. And so the kids who had access to Wi-Fi and technologies in their homes were able to access digital lessons and also do Google Meet sessions, face-to-face -face sessions with the Teachers that kids access to Wi-Fi didn't have those advantages. And so we know that equity has to be a part of our plan. We did some surveying and we had um, approximately 6,000 people respond to our surveys, parents, teachers, um, employees, and we're going to do more surveying, some community members, and people really talked about the fact that they felt that academically kids lost in that last 10 weeks because they didn't have the interaction with their teachers and their friends. 
The other thing is that people are very concerned about returning to school. So parents are concerned as well as the staff are concerned about what will a return look like and how can you ensure my safety. There was a committee that the board put in place, the Strategic Engagement and Planning Committee, and we convened that committee to get ideas and to learn from them in terms of what we could do to um, help think about a reopening for our district. And they talked about training for how to help instruct kids at home when they are not certified licensed teachers. And it's really difficult and hard. So I can speak firsthand experience. My husband and I are raising our nine-year-old granddaughter and she's in fourth grade, or she just finished fourth grade in one of our CPS schools. And so I'm trying to make sure that she's getting her work done while I'm on video conference calls and on other phone calls, doing all sorts of things that she isn't supposed to do. Conference calls, I'm trying to get her to focus. It was hard. I mean, it was really hard, and I have an education background, but it was hard trying to balance this. So for parents who are trying to go home and make sure their kids are doing their work, or if you have to go out and work and then come back to make sure, it's really tough. And that's what parents told us, that they need a lot more help and support and training. And then we also know that if we open, we need to have a bank of people, a bank of subs who are already ready to go into those schools and deliver services in case we have to close or if people become sick. And, and the, the truth of the matter is, um, right now within Cincinnati Public Schools, we have staff members who are confirmed COVID-19 positive, and we also have students, and we know that. So I have a dashboard, and I can look at the information every day. But as soon as sports uh, conditioning and training was opened back up across the state, and we started, even with the precautionary measures in place, we have several cases in which kids are confirmed with COVID-19. And so then we shut down those sports programs. So we have to really become um, comfortable with the fact that, first of all, people are going to get COVID-19 within our district. The most important thing will be what will be our response and how quickly will we act. So we have to have a bank of people ready to go in to help. We also have to have very clear expectations for our kids, for our families, and for our adults in terms of what we have to have happen around education, but also the health aspect of it. And we have to pay attention to transitional grade levels, especially when we think about our sixth graders going from elementary school to high schools. And then really clear, consistent communication with our parents. So these are some guidelines that I'm just going to highlight a few. These are directly from the CDC in terms of considerations as it relates to um, safety precautions related to COVID-19. So you'll see the same things that we've all heard, hand washing, face covering, um, sanitizing, making sure that all of our areas are very clean, thinking about the layout of our classrooms, the use of technology, how food is delivered. So we, we offer breakfast and lunch, and in many schools, we offer dinner. And so just thinking about hundreds of kids going into a lunchroom all at once is not feasible. And so we're looking at a model of, do we deliver the lunches to the classrooms? And so that's where it takes place. The CDC also talks about having small groups of kids, and this is going to be really hard at the high school level, that really stay together in a cohort, and they're not mixing so that you can try to contain the spread. And then staggering um, our schedules, and I'm pointing out just a few, having a COVID-19 person identify point person at every single one of our schools. And then again, being able to respond very quickly to any health concerns that we may encounter. And so when I say quickly, I'm talking about within a 15 minute window. So you say, well, how, how in the world are you going to do all of that? And I would say that it would be near impossible if we didn't have a partnership with Children's Hospital. So Children's Hospital, they are working with us right now. They meet with us twice a week. They have an entire team that's dedicated to the operations of CPS as it relates to health and safety measures. So they're talking with us from the time the kid leaves their home, what happens to, uh, up until they get to school, and then what happens all during the day. So quick example, we said, okay, we know we need the thermometers that you can just hold it up to someone or the scans where the, you come through and it does temperature 
check and we'll mask kids coming in the door. And someone said, well, what about all the kids who come to school on a bus? So I'm gonna load 24 kids into a confined area without a mask and without a temperature check. And then when they get to school, I'll put it on them. It doesn't work. And so Children's is working with us that you may have to have a bus monitor on every single elementary bus. Someone who can do a temperature check, put the mask on the kids, and then make sure that they're maintaining some level of social distance on a bus. So this is huge when you think about the impact operationally to um, our district and all the logistics. So on Monday, Children's Hospital, a team of about 12 people, including the head of their disease control department, will be at one of our schools with our entire team walking through, put a hand sanitizing station here, do your temperature checks here, here's an isolation room. And what we're really looking at, where are all of the failure modes during the day that could happen and how do we mitigate those failure modes? So it's massive. And so we're putting all these things in place even though the board has not yet selected the model that we're going to use in terms of a return to, to school. We looked at some guiding principles. Health and safety has to be um, one of our guiding principles. We really do believe that face-to-face -face interaction is really important for our kids, not only our elementary kids, but also high school kids especially when you think about the suicide rate among high school kids and that socialization that they need, the fact that they need to be with their peers, they need to be with positive influences in terms of adults within our schools. Um, equity, using data to guide our decisions, and then being fiscally responsible. And I'll stay on the fiscally responsible piece for just a moment. Um, you may have heard that out of the state budget, $300 million was, were cut out of the education portion of the state budget. And so Cincinnati Public, about 61% of our dollars actually come from property tax. And property tax collections are down. And the property taxes that are usually due at the end of June for Hamilton County are now due July 17th. So thank goodness we have enough money to float us till then. So there you can see that there are a lot of things that are impacting or will impact our financial situation. So as we really, as my team and I, the performance leadership team, as we thought in terms of how are we going to put together models for the board to, to think through, um, we, we really looked at the risk factor. And so this is something that we came up with. We said, board, there are risk factors educationally and there are risk factors health-wise. And so we have to, to balance them out and know that there's a trade-off. So let me give you one really quick example. If we go completely remote, which means that the kids do not come to school, all of their learning is remote, on this risk management system that we've developed, it's very low risk on the health side, right? Spreading is probably going to be very limited amongst our kids if they're not in school. But it's very, very high risk educationally. And so there's this balance. And so for every um, option that we came up with, we were able to give the board, what's the balance? What are you going to have to trade off for whatever option you're considering? So I, I'm gonna go to some options that we've talked with the board about, and we've laid those options out in terms of risk management. So option one would allow us six feet of social distancing. And with all of our options, we are still thinking about the prevention in terms of temperature check, mask covering, and the, um, the moment anyone um, is identified as having any symptoms to be able to quickly isolate them. And so option one also includes six feet of distance. And of course, within our schools, we can't get six feet of social distancing and having all the kids in session every day at the same time. We just don't have the space. And so one option is for us to bring half of a class back on one day for one week for two days of instruction, and then the remaining three days, then they would be at home doing remote learning. And then the next week, that group would have three days of face-to-face -face instruction. So over the course of uh, two weeks, you'd have five in-person days. 
So now this one is an option that health-wise, it really reduces our risk, but educationally it increases our risk because you have your, the kids who are only really receiving three days of face-to-face -face, um, instruction within a given week, and on some weeks it's only two days. So this one is worrisome to us. It's also problematic for, guess who else? Parents. Parents who need to go to work especially at the elementary level. So what do you do with your pre-K through sixth grader? So, like I said, it's a balancing act. We also then looked at a model in which we would have our, so we're trying to increase the number of days, especially for our young kids. So we looked at a model in which we would have our elementary kids, pre-K through sixth grade, come three days a week. And in order to do this, we would spread them across um, not only the elementary schools, but also our high schools, which means the high school students would be at home at that time. So we could get um, five to six elementary schools at grades four to six in our high schools and spread them out, and have our elementary schools only have pre-K through third grade and spread them out. But that causes a problem for our high school students. So there's always a trade-off. Um, we did look at, so three days for elementary kids and then two days for high school kids. And so what that would mean is that on the days that our high schools come, then the high schools would be spread out in the elementary schools at the upper grade classrooms in terms of classroom because of the furniture. So at least maybe six grade classrooms would work out. So we ran models. So we had our facilities person with us, and we have blueprints and diagrams of every single one of our schools and the square footage of every single space. And for one of our mid-sized high schools, we would need approximately 30 classrooms in an elementary school to accommodate them being spread out as six feet apart using their school and an elementary school. So you can see this is, it can be quite problematic if you're trying to get six feet of social distancing. So then we looked at another model, and I'm almost done with the models, um, in terms of let's get our elementary kids in four days a week and our high schoolers in two days a week, which means we can't really use our high school buildings for the high school students, right? So we thought, okay, well, let's be creative. Let's look at other spaces. The Bengals, they have split. Um, space and the Reds and Convention Center and Cintas and so we called all of these places and either the, they were using their spaces or had plans to use them on their own or the amount of money it was going to cost was way too much, more than we could afford. Again, this option still doesn't offer our kids the opportunity to be in class five days a week face to face and it still poses a problem for parents. So then here's a review of all of those three options that I just expressed, but all of them have um, problems. And I will say that there are absolutely no perfect solutions. There just aren't any. The last two options that we talked about is with all the interventions we put in place, what about three feet of social distancing? And we can keep the kids within their own schools with the space that's there if we have three feet of social distancing. So we could bring the kids back five days a week or we could bring them back four days a week and use one day to do deep cleaning of the buildings. So these are the options that we laid out to the board for them to be able to consider as they think about a return to education. Now I will say with all of the models, the five models that I just uh, showed you on the screen, and all of those models is always a quick closure model that we already have ready to go. So if at any point, uh, once the board selects uh, one of the models, at any point we need to close schools quickly, we'll be ready. So what we're doing now, starting July 1st, from July 1st to September 4th, we are pushing out devices for all of our kids grades two through 12. So that if we have to close very quickly, they will have their devices already at home and ready to go, and we have packets of work ready for them as well. So that we're primed and ready. We, will, we say that um, no matter what option the board chooses, because of the work that we've been doing all along the way, we'll be ready. 
So there are some cost factors. Uh, let me go back one that we have to consider as we think about all of these models. So, you know, in order for the six feet of social distancing to work, in order for the three feet of social distancing to work, there are some things that we have to have in place. So masks. So we had 10,000 masks delivered for our staff just the other day, but we have close to 30, 37,000 kids. And if we're in session all year, they're gonna need multiple masks. So we've set millions of dollars aside for hand sanitizer and washing soap and paper towels and more than we would normally ever have within a school. So we have that that we have to consider and, and, and so we, we believe that we will need um, at least for the first year seven million dollars of CARES Act dollars dedicated to use for precautionary measures. So we have those CARES Act dollars but again we're gonna, we, we will go through those dollars pretty quickly when you think about 37,000 kids. We also believe that even with the measures that I've talked about um, so far, we need a registered nurse in every single school. Because I need a point person to identify a person who has symptoms who, need, who um, should be um, isolated very quickly. And so that's an additional cost. Uh, bus monitors would be an additional cost and more substitute teachers and more substitute paraprofessionals are needed. If the board chooses an option in which um, we have to spread the kids out across the schools, then we need more staff because you're breaking the kids down to smaller groups, which means you need more staff to be able to monitor all those groups. Not just monitor, but to be able to teach. So each model we've laid out, what are the costs and what are the additional costs, and, and you can see that we would have to make major reductions in our current budget to be able to fund all this. So basically to stop doing some of the things we had done in the past. This just shows you all the models in terms of the risk management, where they fall in terms of high, medium, or low risk. And so um, at this point, the board is thinking very carefully about their options. And it, uh, we are hopeful that on Monday, uh, June the 29th, they will have a decision made for us because at that point, we will only have a month and a half before showtime. So we have to move very quickly. I will also say that um, whatever option the board chooses, if it includes a comeback model, we will be looking at the data very carefully um, in terms of the increased cases that are confirmed for our county and for the city to know whether or not we can actually open. So I get a daily report from the um, health commissioner that tells me the number of cases, number of deaths, number of people who are hospitalized. We have a digital academy already in place and we've had it for years. So this is complete remote learning for those families who decide that um, staying at home is a better option for them, and so we're going to offer this to families. So if, if the board says we're going to go back three days a week for elementary and two days for high school, and I have no ideas as to whether or not that'll be their, their selection, but we have an off a, a, um, offering for our parents that say if you really don't feel comfortable, then you can have this digital option, but we would ask that you would speak, um, stick with your choice for at least a semester so that we're not kind of bouncing back and forth. We also will hold seats in schools where the child was enrolled. So let's say I'm in a Montessori program as a child and my parents decide to, to put me into the remote option, my seat at, the, at that Montessori school will still be open for me when I return because a child shouldn't be penalized because their family does, just doesn't feel safe. So then, then just to give you a little bit of landscape in terms of some other districts, what happened during the school closures within counties? One district may do remote learning with technology, another may do it with a device or, or packets of work. And so families who are in neighboring districts start to talk to each other and say, well, why aren't you doing what this district is doing? So coalitions started to form. So for example, the Warren County superintendents all came together and they met and they decided that they're all gonna go back five days a week and will offer a remote option. Claremont County superintendents decided that as well. 
this week Hamilton County superintendents we all got together and we have not come up with a, a complete decision um, or I should say we are not all in agreement at this time that we can say what we will do as a collective group so what's next is that uh, the board will convene their conversation or continue their conversation on the 29th we anticipate that they will make a decision at that point and on Tuesday we will be putting things in motion to be able to make whatever option that they choose ready to go again with the option for a quick closure if need be so there are a lot of moving parts and pieces um, to this uh, July will be planning and then August we will launch the opening of our school year so that gives you just some ideas of what we're thinking about and the partners who are coming to the table. One thing I, I did fail to mention is the fact that um, I mentioned that uh, there are 11,000 households in which kids don't have access to Wi-Fi. And so the Greater Cincinnati Foundation, along with Children's Hospital and the Hale Foundation, they are working with us and Cincinnati Bell to be able to raise money for those 11,000 households. So Cincinnati Bell has worked with us to give us a, a deal of, um, it's approximately $200 per household for uh, Wi-Fi for a year, which is great. And it's for a full 12 months, not a school year, which is wonderful. Um, but in some cases, some of our families still can't afford that. And so we've, um, we have begun a fundraising um, strategy to raise money for that. And so I, I normally say it's $200 per household that we're trying to raise as opposed to $1.9 million, which feels out of reach. So we do have, um, we actually, Children's Hospital, they've already come forward, and they are going to, to support two entire schools for two years, and the Hale Foundation, they've come forward to support some schools. So we have five schools who are in the pipeline to launch this Wi-Fi initiative uh, this summer. So that gives you a really quick snapshot of what's going on in CPS. Well, Laura, we really appreciate that talk. That was a very comprehensive view of how complex the situation is and the challenges that you and other educators are facing. We appreciate it. We have time for a few questions, and if you just want to stand up and say your question, and Laura will repeat it back for the audience because we have people on live stream as well. So we'll take a few questions. Um, yes, so in my conversation with the Hamilton County Superintendent, it really, it sounds as if they're going back five days a week. Um, they just haven't officially announced it as of yet, um, but I believe that that is the consensus to go back five days a week. Um, so we are, there are over 600 school districts in the state of Ohio. Most of them are rural and suburban districts. There are only eight that are considered large urban eight. And the rural and suburban districts are saying that they really aren't seeing the spread of COVID-19 like we're seeing it in the urban core. And so they don't feel that there's a reason why they wouldn't go back full time. So I anticipate that they will be going back five days a week. Dayton City Schools, which is uh, on the list of the large urban eight, they announced yesterday that they're going back five days a week. Yeah. So um, just to give you a little bit more information, I spoke with um, a physician last night and then again this morning saying, you know, tell me what's your professional opinion on the three feet, six feet. And so no one will give me anything that they'll put in writing. But what was said to me is that three feet of social distancing maybe could work if everyone is in a mask, if there's a temperature check, if the ventilation system is good, if there's no coughing, sneezing, or singing. <laughs> maybe it could work. Yeah, so again, no easy answers or solutions. 
saw a gentleman. Yes, so the question it was, is centered around what are the discipline implications to maintaining three feet, six feet, even mask wearing. So um, we've developed an entire student handbook that's related to all of the precautionary measures that have to be in place, as well as a, 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 a staff handbook around all of these measures. And there's an entire section that is dedicated to the enforcement of the three feet, six feet, temperature check, masking, all of those things. Um, I will say that, so we do have disciplinary measures that we're putting in place, but mostly we're trying to approach it from a very positive standpoint. And so we're developing a lot of videos for parents and for kids and lessons that teach why are we doing this and why is this important and really getting our kids engaged in the process. So one of the things that we're most concerned about um, we are concerned about the social distancing in terms of kids, they're, they're going to want to get together. Little kids and high schoolers. And if you've ever like watched the little, little ones, they will pick their nose in a moment, rub it on someone or touch something. And so that is going to be a challenge. Um, what, the other thing that we're, we are concerned about, quite honestly, is there are two things. We're concerned about the little kids wearing a mask and keeping a mask on their face. And we're also concerned about students with disabilities, maybe a child who has autism, being able to keep a mask on his or her face. Um, and then we're also thinking about, though, what about the parent who says, I don't want my child to wear a mask? And so that, that, you know, that may very well and probably will happen. We've had um, cases, and it's not uncommon to school districts, in which parents say, I do not want my child to have a vaccination. And so we have to think about the, the risk and the healthy uh, concerns for the entire community. And, and that's the reason it's so important for us to express the why we're doing these things, is to keep everybody safe, is to keep our adults safe and our kids safe. And so we're working on our kids helping to design and decorate masks, which will make it hopefully a little bit more cool for them to wear them if the board decides we will actually go back in session. But we do have some disciplinary measures in place for those who decide that they will not comply with us. Uh, so the question is, could we enforce remote learning for those who do not want to comply? I'm going to be honest with you, I'd have to check with legal counsel, and we have legal counsel at the table. He's at the table for everything right now. Um, we have in, in certain cases um, excluded kids for a limited amount of time in which they didn't want to comply with us around a vaccination, um, but I believe that they have the right to return. But we have the rights of all the other kids in the room and the adults and the parents and, and, and everyone else too. And so um, it's definitely something we can consider. Thank you. Don't go far away. Don't go too far. So Laura, before you sit down, if you could just stay up for a minute. Uh, no, no, it's fine. It was great. We really appreciate that presentation. Uh, nice to be able to, to have some questions as well, and thank you so much. And I just want to say a quick word. Uh, we know that at Rotary we've got six global focus areas, Rotary International. One of them is supporting education. So this is a, a Rotary International goal or focus area, and our club has a history of supporting children in many different ways. So again, it's, been, it's great to have you here. We really support Cincinnati Public Schools. Uh, without listening to all the things that we've been involved with together between Rotary and Cincinnati Public Schools. Uh, we talked about learning is cool, which is a really good recognition. But we have a number of youth programs at the high school level, uh, including Rotary Youth Leadership Awards, four-way test speech contest. I know you've been here for yes. those. And CPS has been part of that for six years. Yes. Uh, it's been great. And uh, we also have some other programs for high school level uh, students, including Interact, which is a, basically a rotary service club at a high school. So having said that, uh, it's just great to, have you, to hear your presentation.
great to see what CPS is doing, what you're doing with your leadership there. And we just want to recognize you for that. Uh, we are, as Rotary Club and Rotary International, also committed to fighting disease. And the disease in particular we focused on since 1988 is eradicating polio. And we do have an End Polio Now campaign. And as a thank you for you coming and speaking at our club, we are going to make a donation in your honor to the End Polio campaign. And, and since we mentioned four-way test speech program, we also want to give you a four-way test coin, uh, which shows the ethical principles we use in Rotary worldwide. But thank you so much, Laura, for coming. A big round of applause. So just a reminder, uh, we've got uh, no meeting next week, but we'll be back here on July 9th for Changing of the Guard. For those who joined by live stream today, welcome. And we're looking forward to seeing as many people as we can July 9th, either virtually or in the Hall of Mirrors. So thank you very much and have a great rest of the week. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>